And so we're going to look at issues in the Pauline epistles. And it also, if I'm talking too quiet or too fast, just let me know or something. All right, so uh, two weeks ago, Zach showed this, um, uh, this chart. And uh, basically, the point of this chart is to show a scholarly consensus on uh, issues of authorship in the Pauline epistles. And so the vast majority of scholars hold that at least some of the traditionally accepted Pauline epistles were not written by Paul. Um, so we have 13 that are traditionally accepted. Um, three are debated, and three are highly contested. Um, how many of you are familiar with these arguments and um, these kind of rabbit holes to go down? So Michael, Jackson, awesome. Um, so I first came across these arguments uh, a few years back, and it kind of freaked me out because I tried like looking it up, and there wasn't a lot of data or literature on the subject. So hopefully, if you're not really familiar with this issue, you can kind of uh, know what the scholars are saying and um, kind of be better informed. Um, and so in this presentation, because of time constraints, I'm only going to be focusing on uh, the pastoral epistles, which is uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus, because these um, are the most frequently subject to charges of forgery. And genuinely, uh, people say they have the strongest case for forgery. So um, before we get into the like, actual content, we need to be really careful about how we define our terms. So um, the term forgery, it's somewhat loaded. It has some connotations. And so we need to be looking for exactly what we're actually talking about. And so scholars usually uh, use the term pseudepigraphy, which you break it down, it just means false writing, uh, when an author writes in the name of another author. But that's, that's super vague. Um, so what do we mean by when an author writes in the name of another author? So um, we have this neat little list of uh, a spectrum of pseudepigraphy. Um, and so there's many different ways a work can be written uh, in the name of an author that's not the author writing, right? So we have the first level is works that are partly authentic, but have been supplemented by later authors. And we see this um, in historical documents, like uh, Josephus has some works that have been supplemented later, uh, that kind of thing. We also have uh, works written largely by later authors, but relying on some material from named authors. And then works that are generally influenced by earlier authors who are named, or something like works from a school of writers ideologically descended from the named authors. We see this with like um, the students of uh, Pythagoras, the triangle guy. Um, a lot of those people wrote in his name centuries after he was dead, just attributing it to him out of their respect for Pythagoras. Um, we also have works that were originally anonymous, but then they uh, changed the name for whatever reason. And then lastly, we have forgeries intended to deceive the reading audience. And the key word here is intentionally deceptive. Um, so this is the only one where it's like really, maybe you could say malicious uh, in, that, in that kind of area. It, it's, it's one distinct flavor of pseudepigraphy. And so it's worth noting that in the graph before, um, while, while many of the scholars are in the red, that doesn't mean they think necessarily that they were intentionally, um, deceptively, maliciously forged, right? So we need to be careful uh, when we're using things like this because it's, um, it's, it's quite ambiguous. Also, uh, what do we mean when we say author or someone wrote something? In the same way we have a spectrum of pseudepigraphy, we have a spectrum of authorship, right? Um, so when we say so-and-so wrote something, do we mean that that person literally sat down with a papyrus, with a quill, and wrote it out like word for word, literally? Because if you restrict your definition of authorship to that, and say yeah, anything that's not written literally by the person, we throw out of our Bible, you're going to have to throw out Romans. Uh, because in Romans 16, uh, we have a quote that says, I, Tertius, who write this letter, greet you in the Lord. So not even Paul literally wrote out word for word all of his letters. Um, and we have something more in the second form, where uh, the author dictated word for word to a scribe. Uh, we also have the spectrum of an author collaborated with one or more um, individuals to agree on the wording to be written or dictated or an author authorized another person to write a selection of their thoughts, or um, an author wrote as best they could how they can envision a teacher uh, would have spoken. So we kind of see some overlap in the later definitions with uh, pseudepigraphy. Yes? Can you elaborate on page four and what it means for them to authorize another person? So yeah, so basically, we'll get into this. Uh, it's when, so let's say Paul says, has a friend, and he'll say, OK, I want you to write around something on these lines, um, and then that person will take it and then write basically what the person told them to. So the person who's uh, telling them to write it is not physically writing it. 
but the person he told, um, he's kind of like uh, delegating it, pretty much. Did I answer your question? In our last lecture, we talked about like, Cicero a lot. Cicero is famous for, he had a scribe. He would just be like, hey, I'm busy. Write a letter, sign my name on it. Yeah, and so it's important to note this because conceptions of authorship were not necessarily the same as we have now in the first century. Um, so there's a lot of debate on, okay, well, what did the first century think was acceptable? And we'll get into this later. And so with this in mind, it's important to, uh, to remember that not to paint ourselves into a, uh, a false dichotomy, right? Painting ourselves into a corner saying that Paul literally wrote every single word of the pastoral epistles or they're maliciously, intentionally deceptive and we should throw them out of the Bible. That's, that's a, not a good line of reasoning. It, it's painting ourselves into a corner. And some uh, critical scholars um, that argue against Paul and authorship fall into this trap. Um, and we need to be careful of avoiding it and on our side as well. So now here's the basic argument, uh, basic overview, sorry, of what we're going to be talking about. I'm going to give some background information. Uh, then we're going to go over the argument for forgery, pretty in-depth, and then give some positive arguments uh, for Pauline authorship. And so we're going to conclude um, on the basis of these factors that the criticisms made by um, some scholars are not sufficient to meet the required burden of proof to establish a case for intentionally deceptive forgery um, and the positive evidence for some form of Pauline authorship. So that can cover some form means like A1 through A4 range. Um, it's the, both the best explanation of the data and I think it's probably strong enough to affirm, uh, affirm some view of Pauline authorship. And so again, to clarify, I'm only arguing against the last form of pseudepigraphy, the intentionally deceptive forgery. Um, and so also it's super important to remember that when we're dealing with questions that go as far back in time as we are, uh, there's a ton of uncertainty and a ton of falsifiability. We can't know for sure 100% anything that happened, right? Um, and so we need to examine the arguments in this light and um, see what's most probable and not get too hooked up on the fact is, can we be absolutely certain about this? Because you're not going to have that level of certainty that you're going to be able to have in other areas in more recent historical scholarship. All right. So um, a note about my sources. Um, I'm going to be quoting and referencing pretty extensively from these four books. Um, Forged by Bart Ehrman. Uh, it's the main argument against pawn authorship that I'm using. Ehrman, if you're not familiar with him, uh, he's a very prominent uh, New Testament scholar. He uh, teaches at Duke, I believe, still. Or is it, uh, UNC Chapel Hill now. Oh, that's right. Is that right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew it was one of the North Carolina schools. Okay, thanks for that. Yeah. Also, um, I'm going to be t quoting from Hidden in Plain View by Lydia McGrew, uh, Rethinking the Dates of the New Testament by Jonathan Bernier, and The Historical Reliability of the New Testament. And also, um, a ton of research articles that there's not really space on the screen for. So, um, what are the pastoral epistles? I've, I'm going to use this uh, term a lot in this presentation. This term really wasn't become a term until very recently. But basically, it includes uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus. And what makes these letters special is the fact that um, they were addressed to individuals, not a church, right? So when letters like uh, First Corinthians and Romans, you have Paul writing to a church, intended to be read aloud in front of the church, and then distributed um, around for other churches to read. You don't really have this in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. It's mainly Paul writing to an individual, um, some personal words for them, some encouragement, some other kind of stuff, instructions. Not really intended at that moment to be distributed around. Um, and so because of this, they include some differences in content. Um, like 1 Timothy and Titus are very similar. So, uh, some people call Titus the Reader's Digest version of 1 Timothy. And it has a lot of practical advice, like requirements for running a local church. So um, appointing uh, bishops and deacons, advice to women, that kind of thing. And Second Timothy is a little bit different. It's more like a Paul's his impending death, and he's writing some final words to Timothy. It's also important to consider where these arguments came from. So back uh, in the late 18th century in Germany, <laughs> there is this movement. Um, uh, it's a biblical criticism, like kind of renaissance, if you will. Um, where it said, basically, let's take the Bible, let's strip it of all the um, presuppositions we have, all the traditional thoughts about it, and let's examine it like we would any other piece of historical documents, like we would Homer's Iliad or any other thing, and examine it. Let's look and see if we can find common sources, that kind of thing. And so 
this movement had, um, had both positive and negative effects, but it really questioned many of the standard biblical assumptions we have about composition and authorship. And it made some people pretty uncomfortable. Uh, one of the key figures in this movement was a guy named Friedrich Schleiermacher. And uh, he was a German theologian, and he was a, a big figure in this movement. Today, he's known as the father of modern liberal theology, interestingly enough. And in 1807, he uh, sent an open letter to another pastor, which uh, questioned the traditional authorship of the pastorals based on issues concerning content and things like that. And ever since Schleiermacher, it's been increasingly more common for uh, scholars to doubt the authenticity of the pastoral epistles. So, any questions thus far? Gotcha. All right, so let's get into the arguments against Pauline authorship. So, um, again, I'm going to be most referencing Ehrman's argument, um, and his basic argument is that uh, all the pastorals were written by a single author, and that author is not Paul. And this author would have been writing sometime in the early 2nd century, so I think maybe 100 to 150, that range. Um, and again, it is intentionally deceptive. And the, the strength of this argument is in the cumulative case of all the evidence considered. Um, so when you look at all the data, it would seem most um, likely that it was a portrait that wrote it. So uh, the first uh, subcategory of argument is questions of chronology. And the problem is that we can't really find a good timeline or situate the pastorals very well within the Acts timeline. So in 2 Timothy uh, 4.20, we had this little uh, blurb, Erastus remained in Corinth, Trophimus I left ill in Miletus. Um, so we have information there that we can use to possibly date. But in Acts 20 and 21, um, it, it's pretty clear that Trophimus travels with Paul from Greece through Miletus and to Jerusalem. So it's not having him be sick in Miletus. He's going straight through. Um, and it, it seems unlikely the author of Acts will be mistaken because Trophimus in Acts 20 21 plays a pretty key role as he's the guy that the Jews accuse Paul of bringing into the temple. And that's the whole scapegoat for Paul getting arrested and the, the whole pretty important deal in Acts. So there's kind of a tension here if we're trying to harmonize the text of 2 Timothy and Acts. And we have something pretty similar in Titus uh, where he says, I left you behind in Crete so that you should put in order what remained to be done and appoint elders in every town. And so it kind of seems like uh, Paul was maybe doing missionary work in Crete with Titus and then left him. But we don't in Acts see any indication of um, Paul and Titus together in Crete, except um, when Paul's on his way to Rome, but he's, in, he's under the authority of the Romans, and it doesn't seem likely that he would be doing missionary work at that point. So again, we have another tension if we're trying to harmonize. Anyone have any thoughts on these arguments? OK. So um, we need to ask ourselves, well, what's the nature of Acts? Can we assume Acts is supposed to be a 100% complete chronological timeline of all the events in the early church or all the events in Paul's life, for that matter? I don't think we can safely make that assumption. Um, there are several cases in Acts, in Acts 20, uh, 1 through 3 area, when the author uh, skips over periods of time without reference to uh, duration of travel or destinations. So we kind of have these blank spaces mixed out with inacts. So just because we can't easily situate the letters doesn't mean we can't. And some scholars uh, use this, this uh, blank period in Acts 20 uh, to argue for a, a mid-50s date for the composition of the pastoral epistles. Also, the ending of Acts is pretty ambiguous. Um, the last two verses of Acts, Acts 28, 30, and 31, uh, the, the book ends with Paul in Rome. Uh, he's not dead yet, as, as the text indicates. So this leads many scholars to uh, think that Paul is still alive when Acts is finished. And so we have Acts date, uh, dating to around AD 62. And m many people date Paul's death to slightly before AD 68, which would be the death of Nero. And so what we have here is a possible dead space of around five and a half to six years where we don't have any record in Acts or the um, general New Testament canon of Paul's exploits. And so um, we see in Romans 15, 28, that Paul says he wants to go to Spain. And then in 1 Clement, uh, Clement states that Paul's uh, preached to the farthest limits of the West, which naturally in those days would have meant Spain. So um, some scholars will uh, posit a pastoral date in a post-Acts career. Um, 
it, again, this, the post-Acts career was kind of like conventional wisdom in the early church, but um, some scholars point that this is um, a mistranslation of Clement. He's really saying the farthest limits of the West was Rome, and everyone that repeated after was just kind of repeating a misinterpretation of, um, of Clement. So um, th that, that, that's kind of ambiguous, but I, I think it's decently probable. Any, any comments on the post-Acts career? Yes. Got a question about first Clement. Can you give some more background, some background information on that? I don't know. Yeah. Is. So Clement, um, Clement was one of the uh, the church fathers in the early church. I think first Clement dates to around uh, 90-ish uh, in that range. Uh, he was the bishop of Rome, um, and so he, like the, a lot of the apostles, would write letters, um, not intending to be um, on the level of the apostles per se, but still um, writing letters to different churches and that kind of thing. And first Clement is one of his letters. He talks about Paul in it. Yes. Besides this uh, passage from Clement, it seems like a potentially ad hoc explanation. Um, it, so I wouldn't necessarily accept an explanation that just tries to make room for, for other dates. It's not necessarily trying to make room. This was, again, a uh, conventional wisdom in the early church. So if we... If we do have, especially 2 Timothy seems like Paul's about to die, so it certainly indicates, um, and we'll get into later, there's other reasons why we can possibly state that the pastorals were composed in a Roman environment. Um, so uh, you, you, you can say it's kind of um, just a little bit ad hoc, just trying to make room for the, for the composition date, um, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, again, you can make room in Acts. I'm just pointing out there's ambiguity in um, the timeline here. And uh, basically, I don't want to get too, too hung up on this because many of the scholars currently don't even cite questions of chronology as conclusive evidence for a forger date because there's just so much ambiguity of so much we, we don't really know. Um, and we can't, we, we can't really ever know that much about the chronology. OK, got you. Yes, yes, that, that, that's the point. And so uh, the second, um, is it not working? There we go. Uh, the second issue is questions of vocabulary. Um, I think this is probably the most convincing argument for a second century forger. And so the big stat here that you're going to see over and over again is one third of the words used in the pastorals are never used elsewhere in Paul's epistles. And it, you'll see it over and over and over and over. 848 words. 306 are, six are unique uh, to the pastorals. Um, so on its own, I don't think this stands for too much because, again, you're writing to different people, uh, different contexts, individuals, not churches. Your writing style is going to vary a bit. But the real kicker here is that uh, these 300 so words are used with a higher degree of frequency in the second century, which would indicate that it's a second century composition. Any comments on the vocabulary? Yes. Forgeries, Airman say of his like three main points, he thinks this one's his weakest. Vocabulary? Uh, yeah, he says not too much stock should be placed in uh, vocabulary, something along those lines. But I, I still think it's probably the strongest one of the three from other sources I've read. So I've, this is used a lot with these kind of vocabulary and other kind of linguistic pattern things are made, these arguments are made. And I always am really skeptical of this, and I, I've never, I would assume somebody has done this, but uh, I would be curious at, actu at what has been done to actually look at these types of arguments on works of known authorship. Yeah, so that, that's part of the thing. So there's been a lot more uh, studies on the stats that have been done to kind of refine this argument, and there's a, a ton of, like, of debate on what the exact specifications of those studies should be, right? Um, like, what sample size should we use to t demonstrate Paul's known authorship? Like, should we use Second Thessalonians? That's a debated, debated work. Should we include that in the sample size? Should we include Philemon because it's so small? Um, that kind of stuff. Also, like, there's questions about uh, how much tolerance for deviation should we accept from Paul's um, normal writing style? Is one third considered what we would say normal? And this is a question that the people that are into the stats have been trying to answer, and they, they really, it really gets down to like 
how you're going to design the study. And that, that, that's the, the controls you're going to use. And that's really where, where it gets kind of a dead end, in my opinion. It's just a bunch of, you just get into a bunch of like stats conversations. And I don't, I don't think it's super productive in this case. Yeah. Especially yeah. when you have something like an amanuensis in, in between the author and the text. How much freedom do they have to choose words? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yes, Sam. Just to maybe put this argument into the context, if you take an extreme example like Shakespeare, who just straight up made up a whole lot of words, um, <laughs> and then argued that because these words have no prior usage, tell that Shakespeare wasn't written until like the 1850s. Yeah, so I did actually write that in my notes. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, it's, it's kind of the same thing. Um, not an exact comparison, but yeah, you have the same. Because these words were used in the 1850s, we, we date Shakespeare. I mean, um, Shakespeare is another example where people use these arguments trying to, to talk about, you know, was his work original yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah, there, there is a lot of ambiguity there. I, I wouldn't Do you know what like, the base rate is for how very authors are between the words like do we know like Ignatius he wrote like 10 letters in the uh, early second century do we have any uh, uh, do people like to go and calculate how varied his letters are from each other because we don't really well some people do I mean deny that he wrote those but I, I'm sure we do but I, I don't have the number I'm sure that's part of the stats discussion that gets it, like it gets so muddy the more the more you get into it and like what what kind of variables are getting yeah, these were written, all his other letters were written to churches, these were written to individuals. There's a thought that perhaps they were written after the Acts ended, mm -hmm. the book of Acts yeah. ended. So like, if these were written later to individuals rather than churches, Paul was about to die uh, by Romans. Different genre. Yeah, different, different yeah. genre, purpose. different mm -hmm. audience, different, different purpose. Yeah. purpose. Yeah, and then also you have um, which way does the influence go. It's entirely possible that Paul's kicked off the second yeah. centuries. Mm -hmm. All the <laughs> yeah. early church fathers probably start, read Paul and then started writing like Paul. Yeah, exactly. I noticed that when I'm reading Luke, I start writing, when I write something, I start writing a little bit more like Luke. Exactly. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's uh, definitely a big part of it. Um, an another thing that it involves this um, is that in the pastorals, you have a much more Hellenized kind of uh, Greek and Roman vocabulary and style. Um, which would make sense if they were composed post-Acts because Paul would have been spending time in Rome, uh, learning the vocabulary a little bit more. But also, um, what some scholars have pointed out is that this Hellenistic style, um, you find it nowhere else in the New Testament except Luke and Acts. And what you have is kind of this really weird amalgamation of some sections that sound like they're written by Luke style and some sections that are written by Paul style. Um, like you have in the pastorals, a lot of allusions to like medical things, like maybe a doctor would write it. You also have a lot of like Luke's kind of quirky phrases that he uses. Um, so some scholars kind of hypothesize that um, Luke played a role in writing Acts. Like uh, Paul kind of said to Luke, uh, here, write this basic thing to Timothy. And then um, Luke, uh, Luke goes, writes it, Paul texts over it, maybe changes some stuff, and then they send it off. So that, that, that's a possibility because of uh, how weirdly similar the, vo the vocabulary and style is between uh, Luke Acts and the pastorals. Any questions on that? Yeah, and also it's possible that Paul employed a general secretary that would have leniency to change the works. This was not uncommon in the first century. All right, um, so Ehrman also goes into problems of word usage. Um, so like, um, the word faith, uh, which is in the Greek pistis. Uh, basically, in the Undisputed, Romans and Galatians, it refers to like a relationship, your trust in Christ to bring about salvation, right? So, like, saved by grace through faith. But on the other hand, in the pastorals, it mainly refers to the Orthodox Christian body of doctrine, right? So um, in Titus 1.13, you have like what's the faith, the Orthodox teaching. Um, yeah, this just seems pretty sketchy to me because all throughout uh, the New Testament, we have... Uh, in Paul's undisputed epistles, the word faith being used with different shades of meaning, um, like striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, or preaching the faith he once uh, tried to destroy. So it's, it, while these might not mean exactly uh, a relationship or exactly an orthodox Christian teaching, um, it's pretty clear that Paul is using 
uh, the word uh, peace to use with different shades of meaning, different contexts, and different different contexts. And I don't think we should say Paul can only use faith in this one wooden manner. That's not how we talk now. That's not how they talked then either. Um, and Ehrman says the same thing with uh, the word righteousness, um, and it's the same kind of thing. Paul uses it differently in different situations. Any questions on that? Awesome. ideas don't develop over time. Like, okay, maybe Paul, over time, started to use a more narrow meaning for these words, like the church certainly did, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, those these have become very specific meaning words beyond what's used in ordinary language. Yeah, good point. And so that, that's the vocabulary concerns. As you can see, there's also still a lot of unambig uh, ambiguity. You said, I, I don't think this is a super... It's the strongest. I still don't think it's, it's, it's super strong or definitive in saying it was intentionally deceptive. Like the most you have is maybe some of it second century. That, that's really the most you have in this instance. Um, I don't think there's a lot there. So now we can move on to questions of context. Uh, and so the main issue in questions of context is your uh, church ecclesiology, your theology of church. Um, and basically, um, because of the passages in 1 Timothy and Titus where you have instructions for deacons and um, bishops, it seems more um, advanced than church government uh, than some places uh, in the other undisputed Pauline epistles. So Ehrman uses the example of uh, the First Corinthians as an example. And so if you've ever read Corinthians, you know the Corinthian church and it had a lot of stuff going on. It had a lot of problems. But interest, interestingly, Paul never appeals or mentions the leaders of the Corinthian church. He never tells them like, hey, you better get your act together um, and get your, peop get your uh, people in line. Um, instead, he just tells the church to unify and act ethically, which is Ehrman's summary of 1 Corinthians, which I find super interesting that, okay, but, and he, Ehrman basically says that th because he doesn't call out the elders, this demonstrates there was no authority in the early uh, Christian church. And he describes them kind of as like a chaotic gathering, a group of individuals, each of whom had a gift of the Spirit in this brief time before the end came. So basically, there's no leader. Everyone's running around, speaking in tongues, prophesying. It's, it's really chaotic. No one knows what's going on. And this, this argument, yeah, it, it seems really sketchy to me. Uh, because for one, it's an argument from silence, right? Because uh, Ehrman's saying, Paul should have said this. But because he didn't say this, we can include why, which is basically an argument from silence, right? Um, that they've appointed church leaders yes. as they went? Yes, we will get into that very thoroughly, right? So choosing the Corinthians, it seems like the absolute bottom of the barrel. <laughs> exactly, like, exactly. He loves the Colossians, he loves the Colossians. You know? Yes, exactly. And we, we, have, like, we have a ton of references, not a ton, we have some references to uh, authority in the Pauline epistles. We literally, in Philippians, have the same word, bishops and deacons, that's used in the pastorals. So clearly implication of church structure. Uh, also, in 1 Corinthians, the very uh, letter that Paul uh, Ehrman cites as an example that's no leadership or structure, it says, um, Brothers and sisters, you know, the household of Stephanus, they've devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you to put yourselves at the service of such people. So some versions render it put at the service as submit. So here you have this. It's not as clear and cut as um, Philippians, but it, it, it's definitely like you have this connotation of authority and structure, right? And also, in Acts, you have that verse that, that uh, you mentioned um, after they appointed elders for them in each church. And um, the word here used in Acts is different than the word that's used in the pastoral epistles. But it, it's the same connotation, right? It's the same, um, it's, it's the same um, context of structure and authority. Um, so Ehrman's claim that the first century churches were just this chaotic, individualized gathering with no authority, it seems to be kind of a misconstruction of the evidence, right? And he's reading, like Michael said, reading way too much into the, the Corinthian church. Um, yes, Lucy. Also, aren't like Timothy and Titus written to church leaders? So wouldn't it make sense that there'd be more stuff about how to be a good leader in those? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the others are literally written to like the church body. So exactly. it wouldn't make sense to like call out the leaders in that context. Yes. And the disputed ones are the letters to authority figures. Yeah, yeah, part. exactly. And also, if we're going to take the, like, this was written in the older, later thing, that would mean these are written basically a decade after the Corinthians, 
So these churches have had a decade to all get their acts together. So yeah. if, if they have started off chaotic, it's plenty of time for them to put someone in charge. Yeah, and there, there wasn't like one day when all of a sudden the churches had elders in structure, right? It was a much more probably organic and evolving process as was needed um, as people in there were cert mature enough to be put in as in authority positions. Yeah. yeah, so wouldn't it make some sense for the Corinthian churches early on to be pretty chaotic, especially when the people are running amok? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe even if they didn't have the elders they were supposed to have, maybe they didn't, but eventually standards rose um, for churches and church leaders. Yeah. But in the beginning, it was just a bunch of believers who were supposed to be helping each other. Exactly, wasn't yeah. quite so organized. V very good point. Very, very good point. So yeah, that's the ecclesiology concerns. That's one of the most cited ones by Airman. I don't, I don't know if there's a lot there. I don't know if it's, there's a lot there. Um, that was his favorite? That's his favorite? It's, it's one of his. Um, the other one he uses a lot is the Gnostics. Um, you, you can pretty much bring up the Gnostics in every, every single discussion of, um, of like first century early church history and get a rise out of people, right? And so the language in the pastorals, it seems to like kind of indicate Gnosticism, which was, if you're not familiar with it, a, um, a diverse second century mainly uh, heresy that was the bane of the church father's existence. So Ehrman's saying the pastorals, their, their point must have been for Paul, uh, uh, so, someone writing in the name of Paul, uh, to use his authority in like slam dunk on the Gnostics and like end their career forever, like epically owned. Um, and he mentions in uh, 1 Timothy some characteristics that are common to Gnosticism, which would be endless myths and genealogies, um, also to that which is falsely called knowledge, which literally is the word gnosis in the Greek, and aestheticism, uh, which is kind of like uh, avoiding worldly pleasures, avoiding foods and marriages, that kind of thing. So I don't know. It kind of seems to indicate Gnosticism. I mean, it literally calls them out by, by name, except uh, not really. Uh, the evidence is actually, it, 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 it's, pretty, it's pretty vague. Um, the same characteristics that are mentioned um, by the author of the pastorals could literally apply to any first or second century religious sect. Um, it's like, they're super vague. Um, it seems to at least to be a, a Jewish Christian sect because in 2 Timothy we have verses um, regarding that salvation is for all, not just the Jews. So it seems to be some kind of Jewish sect. And while the Gnostics might fit under that umbrella, um, there's no reason to say why it's exclusively referencing them. There's a ton of scholarly debate on Gnostic heresy, it's again, it's a, it's a quagmire, it's a mud pit. And uh, some scholars say that uh, Gnostic theology was around before Christianity and kind of like parasited themselves onto Christianity to kind of propagate themselves. So it, it, it's, it's really unclear. Um, and if they are referencing Gnosticism, it's, it's, their evidence is not enough to point us towards more than a very underdeveloped, incipient form. Um, it, it, it seems weird if the whole point was to slam dunk on the Gnostics, he wouldn't call it out in more detail. And while we shouldn't use this too much and make an argument from silence, we also shouldn't slap a label anti-Gnostic on them because the evidence is just not clear enough. Well, some of these things are very much present in undisputed Pauline. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <It's> you're, like, <laughs> you're, there's definitely proto-Gnosticism referenced in the undisputed Pauline yeah, oh, oh yeah, for sure. And it, it was, it was this, these sects were around from, from the very, very beginning of Christianity. So it's, it, it seems like there's not a huge break from this with the undisputed epistles. And so there's, there's not, again, there's not a lot there. So that sums it up for the arguments against Pauline authorship. What do y'all think of them in general? First one was chronology. So when was it written? I feel like that was the strongest one. It was ambiguous at best. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I feel like that one maybe was the curious thing of where to, since yeah. you can place all the, date all the rest of it, you know, but still not conclusive. Yes, I don't think it's anywhere near conclusive to point us towards a intentionally deceptive forgery. I, I, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if there's enough there to do that. And also, now we can look at the, uh, arguments that are positive for Pauline authorship, so some form of Pauline authorship. And... Um, in any discussion of authorship, you should always start with uh, external attestation. And so previously, uh, scholars regarded the earliest external verification of the pastorals uh, was around 180 by Arrhenius, um, which would have been close to 120 years after the, uh, the supposed traditional composition date. But um, recent uh, investigation by Kenneth Birding has pointed us towards uh, this guy named Polycarp. Uh, 
who, if you're not familiar with him, he was an um, early church leader um, in around the second half of the um, uh, first century and then uh, into the second century. He was the Bishop of Smyrna, pretty important guy. He was commonly believed to be a disciple of the Apostle John, which uh, the John of Revelation, if, if you say that John wrote Revelation, which is a different issue. But um, yeah, so he was a pretty, pretty uh, authoritative guy. And like, um, like a lot of the other um, apostles, he wasn't, didn't claim to be an apostle, but he still wrote letters to churches. And he has one called the Letter to the Philippians, um, which is not Philippians. It's the Letter to the Philippians. And um, the date on here, um, you can really be any, anywhere in the first half of the second century, so around 110 to maybe 135. And Polycarp is like that, you know, you know that old person at your church that's just been reading scripture so much, it's literally like influenced their mind so, so much and everything they say is like kind of in this lens of like uh, scripture. And you know, they're not, they're not gonna cite it and they're gonna say, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, they're just kinda gonna like slip it in in their speech, just like snippets here and there. Well, Polycarp does the same kind of thing. He does this neat little thing where he, um, he says something like, the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. And then he vomits out like five or six different um, different uh, verses, and he's not going to cite them, but it, it's, it's obvious that he's quoting, he's attributing them to Paul based on the previous uh, mention of Paul. And so um, there's three of these clusters in the letter to the Philippians. And um, the first one, it's it, around chapters three and four, and you don't have to read all this on the screen, but it's just there for the visual demonstration. And so you see over here, he name drops Paul, uh, the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. And then he quotes from Galatians. Right and says some stuff about it, and then he, interestingly he quotes from First Timothy six, and you can see right there in the blue is First Timothy, and immediately he follows it by a quote from Ephesians. So this seems to indicate that, at the very least, Polycarp believed the pastorals were written by Paul. Um, whether you can say he was right or not, um, well, I, I, I think it's likely that Polycarp wouldn't have been mistaken about this issue, uh, because. Uh, as some people point out, he was a very important guy in the early church. If anyone would have known who wrote the pastoral epistles, it probably would have been Polycarp. Um, so it it pretty demonstrates, at, at the least, he believed the he believed that some parts of the pastoral epistles were written by Paul. Um, and because if if you say that the forger was uh, was was second century then you're going to have to say he's writing around the same time when Polycarp was writing this. And then you have this weird situation of like, well, how would Polycarp believe that this was a traditionally uh, Paul document when it was just written like maybe 10, 15 years earlier at, at the earliest? So it, 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 it just seems unlikely that Polycarp would be mistaken about this. Yeah, Katie. Well, it just seems like those two verses were really like key Jesus verses. Like Jesus is said both of those things all the time, just very common church verses that a lot of apostles and people were probably passing on. So it's, I don't know, I guess it just seems that they're, they're not really like unique to Paul in the sense that they have this very unique thing that has never been said in the church before. Yeah, but, but the, the, the critical thing, that, that's right, they're, they're very um, kind of creedal in Jesus language, but the, the key thing is that they're mentioned in between the, 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 the two generally universally accepted Pauline text. So which would indicate that Polycarp is attributing this to Paul. Um, and also, this is not the only, this is not the only uh, cluster reference we have. We have another one where he references 2 Timothy 4.10. So, yeah. Are those quotation marks, was that like him indicating that he's quoting somewhere, or is that added like after? Um, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I probably wouldn't have sure done no so. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, was yeah. Like, is that I, 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 I definitely, it was definitely the, where, where, I, where I copied from, or me, me editing it in. References Paul in the first sentence. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. The, the, the key thing so is, is he no he he name he name drops Paul and then he he um he cites all these verses and he's not I put those parentheses in there those aren't in the original original manuscript I, I put the parentheses yeah yeah I should have put the square ones I guess. What about the bullet point? Uh, that that is original actually. He bulleted out all all this. No, no, no. Pretend that they're Paul's by by feeding Paul's What if he wrote those? He might Timothy stole from him. What if? Okay, so we need to move on because we're running out of time. But we also we also have potential citations in other references, but they're kind of unclear. And so this dovetails with 
our next point, which is um, uh, attitudes in the early church surrounding forged scripture. So there's kind of this myth floating around. Uh, Ehrman doesn't quote this. He, in fact, argues against it. That the, the, the notion that uh, the early church... Uh-oh. Uh, yes, exactly. So we can conclude that Timothy grew up with a knowledge of the Jewish scriptures, which would be the sacred writings, and that probably at least one of his parents was Jewish. We also... It would be really weird in that culture if he mentioned the mom and the grandmother, but not the dad, if the dad was a spiritual influence. So it kind of leads us in the direction that probably the dad was not in the picture, or he was a Gentile. Um, th that seems like a possible inference. And so we can say, OK, well, what does Acts say? Does Acts corroborate this testimony? Um, and it, it, it does. Acts, uh, Acts literally uh, it says what we inferred in uh, 2 Timothy. So Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, and there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. So what we inferred in the previous passage was confirmed in Acts. And it doesn't seem like this would be uh, like a detail planted to um, increase the, uh, um, the credibility, right? That's not something you would think to add in your Ex Exactly, because... But would, would they make a... Also, the way they phrase it now, they didn't say a Jewish woman in Timothy. They just said this person. And the, the, thing, the deal with the... Uh, he mentions the, them by name. And it seems really weird because if, if, if they're not named in Acts, why would you go to the trouble of naming them in Second Timothy if, you, if you're forging, right? It just seems kind of weird. And it, if you do say there's a forger, well, then you're kind of like maybe accommodating for the argument for a second century forger. And then you're... Um, you're, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that that... Yeah, for me, it's like you have something that completes the picture that you only assumed in one, but then you, got, Ex then you went, oh. Exactly, so, exactly. And, but you might, not, you might miss it, too. Yes, if yeah. you're reading through Second Timothy, you, you might say, oh, that's what we're about in Acts, but probably not if you're just reading through it. Um, but that's not the only one. So we also have... Um, uh, Paul mentions, uh, he has this quote in 2 Timothy 3, now you observe my teaching, um, my patience, my love, all this, uh, my persecutions and my sufferings, the things that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, what persecutions I endured. So of all Paul's persecutions, he calls out these three specific ones to Timothy. Um, why these three, and why does he emphasize that Timothy should know about him? Well, if we go back to the passage we referenced earlier in Acts 16, 1 through 3, um, we read that... Uh, Paul went on to Derby and Lystra, and a disciple named Timothy, he was well spoken of by the brothers and sisters in Lystra and Iconium. So what we can do, we can infer that Timothy was already a Christian by this time, because he was a believer in this area. We also infer that it was possibly Paul who converted him, um, because Paul references uh, Timothy as, in 1 Timothy as my true child in the faith, which is a term he uses to refer to people he's converted. Um, and if, if we say that, okay, well, probably... Paul converted Timothy, we can say, oh, that would make sense that happened in his previous visit to the region, which would have been Acts 13 and 14, which is the very passage that it uh, deals with this persecution he mentions in, um, in, uh, in 2 Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3. So these persecutions would have no doubt influenced Timothy, right? Uh, just imagine like the day, very recently after you're converted, the guy who converts you all of a sudden is like dragged out in the street and is just beaten and abused. Like, that's going to leave an impression in your mind. And it's probably something that uh, Paul, Paul's using uh, when he's about to die, right, to bring to Timothy's recollection. Um, and like, the key thing here is notice how many inferences we had to make. Like, we said, uh, we can, based on this, we infer this and this, this, this. And they're not necessarily hard, influ hard inferences. They're not like huge gaps in logic or like we have to suspend our disbelief to kind of they kind of just fall naturally into place, right? And it's not the kind of thing that a forger would go to this much trouble and say, um, I'm going to do this, like, this leads to this, 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 this. I, I, don't, I think this tends to point um, uh, tor towards a, 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 a genuine work. Um, um, and I, I think if you posit a, uh, at least a, um, 
intentionally deceptive forger, then you're gonna open up a whole, like, more problems you're gonna have to explain. Any comments on, on that one? No? All right, well, um, that, that's basically the conclusion of what, what I did. Um, so I, I think the evidence presented by critical scholars, it, it's interesting, certainly, sub, certainly something to consider, but uh, I don't think it demonstrates a case for intentionally deceptive forgery uh, that's strong enough to discount the approval of the early church. Um, I think uh, adding a forger might complicate the data in the second century, at least one that's intentionally deceptive. And uh, the evidence I don't think is strong enough to make this claim that it's, uh, that it's intentionally deceptive. And so when we consider Polycarp's external attestation, early Christian attitudes, um, and like undesigned coincidences, I think the evidence on the balance favors some form of Pauline authorship. Um, we can debate what role Paul actually played, whether he physically wrote them, whether he had Luke write them, um, whether a scribe wrote them, whether they or not they were adapted later in the second century. You can debate those questions, but I think, I think um, that the evidence on the balance favors some form of Pauline authorship. Um, and you, coincidence is, hasn't always been um, researched, right? Right, and, and right. Out. So, I mean, what do they, what does, like, Bart Ehrman think about that now? I mean, do they... She doesn't mention it in this book, it. no. Um, yeah, and I, I, I really can't find any, any reference to, to that or um, the, um, the argument from, like, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, what was it? The, uh, the Muratorian fragment, like uh, in most of the arguments I've read, they don't address that, um, at least, which I think that, that's, that's some pretty, it's something you should definitely consider because it, it has something to say. And mo none of them mention Polycarp, um, for one for I've read at least, um, which is interesting. Um, well, and I don't know how to hear. I know at, when I was at Rutgers, every, everybody used to take, uh, all the Christians that came to campus thought, oh, yeah, I'll take that New Testament class. I'll go, I'll, that'll be good. I can make a good grade. And they have Bart Ehrman as their text. And all of them come to Russia and Christine go, oh my gosh, nobody <laughs> wrote the gospel. We don't know who wrote the gospel. I mean, it'd be up in arms, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder if it's even, if all, I mean, really, it's, it's almost comical. They, the, the, I, and I would begin to tell people, no, don't take that class. You know, that's ridiculous. So Ehrman generally takes the position that's like the most opposed uh, to like the traditional notion. Um, so he, he's usually on the out, on, as far as scholarship is concerned, he's generally on the, on the more extreme end of the spectrum. Like um, you have some like the more like super conservative Christian ones over here, and then you have Ehrman on the other end. And where he says like scholarship accepts this, like the scholarship, it's more complicated. Most, most of them probably don't think that it was necessarily intentional. There's a, again, there's a spectrum. Um, and so Ehrman, I think, falls into the, into the line of painting a, maybe a, a false dichotomy. Um, so yeah, not necessarily that he's he's always on the far end of the spectrum generally. Katie. So while uh, I think the the critical scholarly arguments were quite weak, on the other hand, like the arguments on the other side, basically it's just saying that there was early attestation, right? Like I mean, it's not that strong either. Um, you kind of had to fall back to just saying, think, well. Well, I, I think that the, the strength of some of those arguments you need, it, they actually have the same issue with both of them, I think, which is you have small sample sizes. Yeah. Because you don't really know how much divergence there is in a certain corpus if you only have like seven letters and maybe a couple thousand words. But likewise, with these undesigned coincidence things, like, has anyone actually tried to match up, say, the Acts chronology with... Uh, the stories, the Thecla stories, for example, like maybe that fits with the chronology. Yeah. Maybe there are undesigned coincidences yeah. there as well. You know, I, I, I don't know what. There's a lot of hi untested hypotheses. Exactly. Which, which no, is, not just untested, untestable. Well, which, which is which is yeah. the issue that the fact that you're never it's, there's so much unfalsifiability. You're just when you're dealing with so few manuscripts and like so few writers in such a far back period of time, you can never be you can never be like that certain about anything. Yeah, it seems like this argument largely hinges on who has the burden of proof. Because neither side really has a great, you know, clear yeah, cut. That's what your starting point is going to be. Ex exactly. Um, and it, it, you, can, you can kind of debate about who has the burden of proof. Um, the fact that they were not doubted until very recently, that 
they, they, and to discount the authority of their, their early church fathers, you should bring some pretty substantial information. Um, Yeah. But, I mean, think about, too, why was Hebrews accepted into the canon? Exactly. We don't know who wrote it. And, yeah, yeah, but they thought it was Paul. Well, no. And that was used as an argument no, 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 for not canonicity. Uh, m- m- most of, a lot of the early sources don't, don't um, have Hebrews as Paul, I don't, I don't think. There's a lot of people arguing. It was like Peter, it was Clement. Yeah, it, that is, yeah, that, that, it was, that one was pretty, pretty, pretty debated even in those times, I think. All these people are wrong. It was Paul. <laughs> We do not know who wrote the Hebrews. We do not know her name. Hebrews. Yeah, which was, which was funny. Uh, in the graph earlier, they lumped that one in with all the other, like, I mean, no one thinks that, but they just kind of threw it on the end for the New Testament graph. All right. Any, any final questions?